hello everybody it is the end of july 2023 and here's another video in the summer series about our climate uh, research this one is a general presentation that i already had been giving uh, since november 2013 and i have uh, adapted it put some new information in it and to make the message even more clear what i want to say now the message that I can tell already from the beginning is, and it's the title of the talk, is that the state of science, science is dead. But on the other hand, I will call it science is dead, long live science, because you actually cannot uh, make people to stop uh, thinking intelligently and come up with new ideas and do science, even if it is on a, let's say, amateuristic level. This entire thing is also uh, then framed by the famous uh, uh, Maxim of uh, Nassim Taleb, that is this uh, this guy here, and uh, he said, and I completely agree to this, uh, is if you see fraud and don't shout fraud, then you are fraud. Like always, by the way, this uh, video, you can uh, see the link on it, you can see, find in uh, stalinga.org. That is my own non-profit sign organization and it's not not for profit but it's, it's not non-profit because i never got a cent for anything so it is really non-profit science organization so uh, here we go have fun so first i want to say that this is uh, the background image is uh, some uh, image uh, some photo i've taken uh, some 30 kilometers north of me in the mountains of the algarve Beautiful country, beautiful place for making a nice walk. This one was done in the winter, and as you can see, even then we have very nice weather here. Okay, so the science, what is the definition? It is that, um, that science is actually uh, the knowledge you want to uh, acquire. Uh, and it's also a method, a way how to acquire this knowledge. The science is the search for knowledge, or actually it's the love for knowledge. And uh, as, as such, it's part of uh, philosophy in general. It's not equivalent to philosophy, but it, that if, for instance, also has things like ethics and so on, and science there, it is just about uh, finding this knowledge. And it's the knowledge and only the knowledge. It is not important for whom you're doing it, how you're doing it, why you're doing it, or exactly what you're studying. It is just for the love of knowledge. So that is uh, science. And to give you a nice, uh, also to make it a little bit more entertaining, this video, here I take actually uh, what the difference of things that are, for instance, that are not science, is when you do just research in general. So what now, if you found out that women have 8% smaller brain. So let me immediately make this uh, presentation a little bit more polemic. But yeah, I, I will come back to this also to explain why, why this is relevant and why this is um, in, the, in the context of, of science. And I put here two funny uh, photographs. You can see here this woman seems to be having a, a huge head. And this guy here seems to be having an extremely small head, like a peanut brain. But this, of course, uh, both of them are optical illusions. They are just, I demonstrate, I put them here for decoration and to make it a little bit a lighter talk today. So, um, as I said already, that these kind of things, can you actually today still uh, mention this? Can you say this if you discover this, if you're doing science and come up with this? Is it not becoming too much politicized? Like uh, women have 8% smaller brain. Can you say this actually? Men and women evolved from apes. Can you say this? Well, in modern times you can say this. I don't think you can easily say the first one. But that men and women evolved from apes, this by now is very well, well uh, acknowledged. But at the time of Darwin, Darwin, it was not so easy to say these things, just as today you cannot say that. So it's very much politicized. Um, you can blow up the planet with nuclear fission, like uh, since uh, uh, Curie. There we found out that actually that the... Um, that such a thing is, is possible. But should we then research this? Well, for science, yes, because it's for the love of knowledge. Maybe for politics, not. Uh, the capital is, is destroying humanity. Is the capital actually, is this true or not? Well, one of the greatest scientists ever, uh, Karl Marx, he uh, said so, but you can study this. Can you study this? At the time in 2013, I thought you were not uh, allowed to say this, but actually it has gone in 10 years, it's gone uh, full circle because now it's the only thing that you're allowed to say. And things like you cannot make any statement about the existence of God or religious st statements in general, even though that Gödel said that such a thing would not exist. 
I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just putting it here how things have are polemic. And science has nothing to do with polemics. It will study because of finding knowledge. Uh, there is no politics. There is no money involved. There is not for profit. There is no religion. It doesn't matter what other people think or believe. It is about finding out the knowledge. Science is also not uh, knowing how to make things that we would call technology or uh, actually making these th uh, things that would be engineering. So that is not science. Um, science is also not a quality mark, like I always say, like uh, uh, we see very often on the news to, to give uh, a study a little bit more importance. Uh, they would say like a scientific study has found out that and then it comes that they already prepared you for believing the things that is going to be said. But science can be done in a very amateuristic way as long as it's done by the scientific method. And please watch the videos. I put two videos about the scientific method, what it is and what it is not. But I will anyway come back to this a little bit uh, today. But in, for in more detail, what is the science itself, the scientific method that uh, I will gladly refer to you about the videos the, of the to the videos that are on Stalinga.org. It is not some kind of advanced intelligent research as if it's for some kind of quality statement. For instance, just a tallying of fish stock, knowing how many sardines in the Algarve waters exist, even if it is done very in a very complex way, that is not necessarily uh, science. Science is also not solving problems like uh, us, like my own research, which is done uh, research, uh, done to study uh, the solar panels to fight uh, the problem of uh, climate change, that if we use renewable energies, that is not science. That is once again, that's technology and engineering. This one I also found, I don't know who said it, but philosophy or science is not a strategy. Very well said. So the history of science, let's start uh, when it was getting a little bit more important, that's with the, the Renaissance and then the illumination, the 17th and 18th uh, century. S science was a study of natural laws, so it was not mathematics. Once again, I refer to the videos about uh, the scientific method. Mathematics is not science. Studying and understanding the world around us, exactly. The, so the real world, not the virtual world of mathematics. Trying to describe it in simple laws, or to put it as simple as possible, like Occam's razor and so on. Um, and the th people that were at that time were very famous and they put our knowledge forward are, are people like Galileo, Darwin, Kepler, Newton and so on. Those, those were the great scientists from before. Uh, now, in the mid 20th century, that is probably the, the, the most uh, the productive time of uh, science. And then it was defined by science is the research that follows the scientific method, which is a little bit like circular definition because it defines it in itself. But anyway, scientific method, go to stalinga.org and you will find the explanation of that. The science reached its maximum maybe 1940s. And from that moment on, it is only going uh, downwards. And I will actually show this to you in a moment in one of these slides that it's really the case. Somebody now said, for instance, so this is the late 20th century when uh, things were going completely uh, haywire. Um, science is reliable, teachable knowledge. Well, that is a, a strange way of saying it because this you can make in this way, you can make all religions uh, science because reliable is a fuzzy word and uh, a dogma, which is uh, a religion, a dogma is by definition, dogmatically, it is uh, reliable because it's been uh, defined as being reliable. Therefore, from now on, religion is uh, science. And actually, this very much resembles the state of the uh, 21st century, where the things that we believe, actually, they are uh, underpinned by some kind of uh, science, which they say. And I'm constantly saying that it's then a high quality that our religion is uh, supported by science, therefore follow the science, meaning follow my religion. Um, that is then we have become dogmatic. As Eckhart Tolle said, dogmas are collective conceptual prisons and the strange thing is that people love their prison cells because they give them a sense of security and a full sense of I know. Nothing has inflicted more suffering on humanity than its dogmas. Or in other words, even the modern science is inflicting damage on uh, humanity. And that is caused because it's been done dogmatically. And of course, once again, please see this in the, um, uh, that to the relevance to the climate change uh, dogma that they now constantly call science. 
I will uh, come back to this in this uh, video, don't worry, I will explain it again because this video is also based on the research in climate change. Late 20th century, they also started making a distinction between pure and fundamental science, uh, such as uh, applied, um, pure or fundamental science, and uh, compared it to applied science. So now, from now on, money could be made with science. And wars, maybe even more important, wars could be one. Uh, I started my research in um, radiation defects in silicon. And I didn't know, naive as I was, that this was because in this way we were expecting to win the war with the Russians. That if we had silicon uh, computers that could stand a nuclear war, could uh, survive in a nuclear war, then we would win the war. I didn't know that, but it was for me quite a letdown. Uh, to tell you, I started my career in 1988, I started doing research and I was integrated in a group that do, was doing research of defects in, in this, mostly silicon. And now also, they, for instance, they say that we have computer science and we have rocket science. But rocket science is not science, that is engineering, it's rocket engineering. And rocket engineering is quite complicated, much more complicated than most of science, to be honest. So. A rocket, to call it rocket science, to make it uh, some kind of quality label, but rocket engineering would be just as high quality. It's very complicated and not rocket science is not better than rocket engineering. So rocket science, please don't call it rocket science, call it rocket engineering. In 2013, now, this was the first time I started giving this talk, in 2013, nearly all science is required to make profit. We have an entire economy based on doing science somehow. And maybe even more important, all this scientific research, at least in, in Europe, is centralized and in it, in it's sanctioned by the uh, central uh, government. All science of all my colleagues is funded by state-funded uh, projects. And you can already expect that this will probably go, uh, that this is going completely wrong if you let the politicians decide about uh, science. Now, um, 21st century, if you now write a project proposal and have to explain why it's beneficial for society, it is not science. It is research at best. Once again, science is not to solve problems. It, it has no relevance. At least it's not intended to have relevance. See, for instance, the European program, Knowledge-Based Economy. That is from the uh, Agenda 2020, Horizons 2020, I should say. Uh, see also the, the publication about that, which is exactly called Knowledge-Based Economy, that you can find in stalinger.org. Now imagine Einstein in uh, the 21st century trying to make a project proposal and then they will tell him probably something like uh, that's all very well Mr. Einstein but what about the milestones and deliverables so what about the, the profit for society that we can come uh, get out of this and even Einstein himself said that anyone who thinks science is trying to make human life easier or more pleasant is utterly mistaken so you see how things have changed in uh, let's say one century here we go with this uh, about the, the women's brains are shorter. In 2013, science also has to be politically correct. For example, imagine that you discovered that women have 8% smaller brains. Then, of course, what you have to do as a scientist, in, in brackets, as, as, a, as a researcher, is to say female brains are smaller than male brains, but used more efficiently. Now, um, I'm immediately starting uh, thinking like, why would then uh, nature, with all this Darwin uh, evolution theory and so on, why would nature waste uh, on, on human brains 8% uh, extra volume uh, while it is apparently not necessary? Why would uh, nature waste, waste energy on, on that? But then again, me as a stupid, uh, non-politically correct, uh, non-scientist, modern scientist, I would probably be removed for that remark. I would be removed from the pool. Imagine writing women have 8% less brains and are more stupid. Well, say goodbye to your career. Everything has to be politically correct. And this one I found in the University of California at Berkeley, where I was happy to also have uh, worked. And they made some kind of, uh, to explain to their students, they explain how science works, the flow chart, and they put it into three things. Exploration and discovery, community analysis and feedback, and benefits and outcomes. So there is res research, okay, yes, that is part of it, to, to do research. But the community, 
That is not the definition of science. And the benefit for society. That was never the definition of science. That is not a scientific method. Where does uh, Berkeley get this idea from? So let's take a look at the first part. University of California, Berkeley. What is research? They tell uh, develop technology, address social issues, build knowledge, inform policy, satisfy curiosity, solve everyday problems. No, that's not correct. It's not solve everyday problems. It Well, satisfy curiosity, yes, this is nice. Satisfy curiosity. Build knowledge, yeah, that's nice. But inform policy, that is politics. Address social issues, that's engineering and technology. Develop technology, that's technology. So they just redefined the, def the, the, the redefined uh, science, the, the concept of science. Why? Here we go on, the second part, community, feedback and peer review. That's not science. Replication, oh yeah, okay, that's nice, replication, feedback. Well, let's then say like, because they want to replicate, they have to give us feedback somehow. Publication, yes, we have to inform our uh, colleagues what we have done. Discussion with colleagues, okay, I can just even, but peer reviewing, no, no. It is not that they can tell us if we can publish or not. That is completely up to us. Uh, continuing here, the replication. Rep I call this replication schmeplication because they actually say here in Nature, uh, the comment from the editor, or I guess it's the editor, Mina Bissell, saying the risk of the replication drive because they say like well, we're spending so much money on it and it has to make profit. We're spending so much money and replication is costly. So let's just abandon the entire idea of uh, replication. Instead of doing replication, we could do something uh, useful and it has to be commercial. Therefore, we can actually let's just skip this replication thing. So let's remove it. And then I think like when a source of information has a stake in discussion, its information has to be ignored, to be honest. Here another one the, from the same nature. They say that uh, the editor here was uh, actually fired from the job because led through a politically incorrect uh, paper. This is about uh, climate change when somebody uh, wrote a, a publication and it got accepted in the journal. And it was saying that actually the global warming ideas are not correct. And therefore the editor had to be fired. Hmm. Political pressure. Editors, editors will now be afraid to publish climate skeptic papers, scientific, therefore we get a scientific consensus. Now I've been working uh, uh, more than 30 years in science and I've really seen that the, the, this entire behavior of the editors is ever more to have politically correct uh, papers accepted and, and always avoid polemics. It, it came to a point that uh, for the last 20, 15, 20 years I never get feedback anymore from the referees because they either say that uh, oh uh, this is complete nonsense without explaining why or they will say this happened to me also that Stalinga has a, a political agenda reject or they actually said in one of them they said like I don't like it well there's nothing for you to like you have to say if uh, if I made have made scientific errors if my reasoning is not correct or if I use the wrong data that is your job it's not your job to telling me how much you you like it but in the last 15 years, no, any scientific analysis of uh, the papers is done by uh, peer, by, by, by peer scientists. And for sure, the editor actually doesn't send it to the uh, uh, referees anymore because the paper itself, the outcome would be uh, damaging to the journal and the editor can actually lose uh, his or her job. So once again, peer review, schmear review. Schmear view, I should say, because it is peer reviewing is basically gone. It's getting even worse because here in Nature it said that peer reviewers urged, urged to speak their minds. It is actually proposing here that uh, reviewers, referees of uh, public publications of um, manuscripts, they actually should not analyze it on a scientific way, but just if they think that something is wrong, if they have the gut feeling that it's wrong, they, they can uh, reject it. So if it goes against their beliefs, then they can reject a manuscript. Not if they can find anything wrong with it, but if they believe there is something wrong with it, then um, they can reject the paper. Well, you can see that this entire peer reviewing is now peer review, schmear, schmeview, 
because there is there is nothing left of peer reviewing. It has become a completely political, political religious uh, institute, the peer reviewing. I would also at this point, I would like to you to uh, then again to go to uh, stalinge.org and then about this paper that we have written about uh, peer reviewing and how that creates a consensus. But maybe more of that later. I have here also um, read the book of um, Anne uh, Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged. And this is so relevant that I would like to read it to you um, in this way. Uh, the idea in this book is that they have sort of like um, created a community where everybody receives according to his needs. That is the Marxist maxim, as you all know, that he said in um, Critique to the uh, God uh, Project. And where he says that everybody should work according to his abilities and receive according to his needs. Now, the projects that we're going to submit as a scientist, they are approved by such peers. So we're going to do some kind of voting. The state confiscates all wealth and then distributes it among the scientists by in a, in a voting uh, way that our peers are voting. Well, listen to what uh, Ayn Rand uh, wrote in her book Atlas Shrugged. It says there, well, anyway, it was decided that nobody had the right to judge his own need or ability. We voted on it. Yes, ma'am, we voted on it in a public meeting twice a year. This is how we do a peer approval of a, a peer project, projects by peers. How else could it be done? Do you care to think what would happen at such a meeting? It took us just one meeting to discover that we had become beggars, rotting, whining, sniveling beggars, all of us because no man could claim his pay as his rightful earning. He had no rights and no earnings. His work didn't belong to him. It belonged to the family, to the state. And they owed him nothing in return. And the only claim he had on them was his need. So he had to beg in public for relief from his needs, like a lousy moocher, listening to all his troubles and miseries down to his patched drawers and his wife's head colds hoping that the family would throw him the alms. He had to claim miseries because it's miseries, not work that had become the coin of the realm. So it turned into a contest among 6,000 panhandlers, scientists, each claiming that his need was worse than his brother's. How else could it be done? Do you care to guess what happened? What sort of man kept quiet, feeling shame? And what sort of man got away with the jackpot? So we have to say constantly in the peer reviewing that um, that we that our research is of utmost importance to society. If not, then society is going to die. So we have to study climate change because if we don't study climate change, we're all going to boil and rot in hell, so to say. Well, that is not how it used to be. And also remember that if we use peer reviewing, um, which will wind up in a consensus, but this consensus, as we all know, the classic example, which I always use, is of Mr. Galileo. He also was going against the consensus. He might have been one of the few that said that the earth was uh, revolving around the sun. And he had actually to renounce his uh, words. But when he died, he said on his deathbed, apparently, I don't know, so the story goes, he says, Eperci move, I hope I uh, I uh, pronounce it correctly. It means something like, and yet I insist, it moves. People going against the consensus are scientific heroes, never the ones who repeat the consensus dogmas. Okay, um, so this I want to also to explain a little bit how our uh, publication in um, Monte Carlo uh, methods and applications, uh, sorry for that, it's in stalinga.org. So ran referees are randomly taken from the literature, more papers published, more chance of being selected for refereeing, referees with allowed cognitive biases, the religious, gut feeling, ignore scientific reasoning and accept papers in favor of their beliefs more readily than those against them. Result, you, this is a positive feedback system. If a certain belief has a slight advantage over contradicting belief B, B will be filtered out completely in a Dar Darwinistic peer reviewing way. Belief B without publications will get no funding and will be without a, a job. A believer B, I should say. Voila, the great heroic consensus. 100% saturation, a nice social network of like-minded dogmatic idiots, a new religion. Okay. 
So uh, the 21st century science, it is general, you can do research, including technology and tallying and uh, engineering. It has to be politically correct and it has to make profit. It no longer says that science has to be the truth. It should just make profit and be politically correct and do any intelligent kind of work. Science does not even have to be innovating. So uh, the, the, the idea that science is dead, long live science, science is really dead. And we can actually mark the day when it, when it happened. You can see here, this is also in, done in nature. They did uh, a tallying. Of course, that's how it is now. A tallying about uh, innovative publications or disruptive science. So if people came up with new ideas, and you can see it was steadily from the 1940s, as I told you, it was going down, 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 down. And for instance, my physical sciences, that was already getting worse and worse, but basically also life sciences, biomedicine, technology, all of them basically, they dropped, and some of them dropped to zero. And that is what they call the day science died. So what is remains, we have a little bit technology and we have a little bit uh, social uh, sciences, which is uh, basically describing uh, religion. Science itself has died, and that is in, what is this, 1996. I started my career, let's say, in 1988, and I've seen this last, this last, I've really seen it happening that nobody is anyway, people are just publishing, but there are no new ideas anymore. If you want to have some ideas, some in, interesting papers, they are mostly from the 70s and 80s, and this is still when there were still some ideas in my area, which is physical sciences. Here, um, Berkeley goes on, they're saying that they're just dismantling, they're just re redefining uh, what science is. They're saying misconception. There is a single scientific method that all scientists follow. Yes, that is the case. Science is circularly defined by the scientific method. And once again, watch the video about the scientific method, what it is. Um, and then they say correction. The scientific method is just one of the ways in which you can do science, of course, because if that would be the only way, all this politically correct research about technology and profit making would go down the drain. Misconception. Scientists are completely objective in their evaluation of scientific ideas and evidence. Well, they should be. If they're not, they're fraudsters. But they just redefine and say, like, it's okay if you're an individual scientist and you don't do science, you don't follow the scientific method, that doesn't matter. Other people will correct you. Well, they don't because they were religious idiots, as we have already established some slides ago. So they become a social network and they will actually, uh, if you're a scientist, they will actually remove you from the, uh, from the pool of scientists or pseudoscientists. So... Uh, please, Berkeley, get your act together because you're destroying science. Science has been redefined. It's okay if you're biased, your colleagues will correct you. That is, of course, is wrong. Misconception. Science contradicts the existence of God. Well, yes, uh, it would, as I said, Mr. Gödel, or it could, it, exactly, it could. Nothing is forbidden. No subject is forbidden. But Berkeley getting his funds also from the churches, I guess, that the freedom of belief is a human right and science is, in, um, is helping to implement the human rights, which is very noble, but it's not science. In fact, science and religion are at war. Religion is believing without proof or question. It is faith, while science is knowing, is knowing based on evidence, deduction, induction and falsification. So they, they really, they are at war with each other. Note, there is no war between religion and technology. Engineers implementing the miracles of God. There is no problem with uh, science and engineering. But here is a declaration of war done by Martin Luther. He clearly said, reason is the greatest enemy that faith has. Worship a 30... Uh, okay. This is the biggest declaration of war imaginable. In 2013, faith has won the battle. Reason is forbidden, as per declaration of the United Nations and adopted by universities, such as the University of California at Berkeley. To give you an example here, just a typical um, example of a comment on a typical blog where the paper of uh, Roy Spencer was being discussed. And then 
Pilke apparently took it up for Mr. Spencer defending it, and but then says, well, all science is politicized from the get-go because funding must be provided. Decisions about the worth of a study must be made. Those decisions are essentially political. What the science indicates is serious trouble, so now we're telling again, I believe in my climate warming religion, and then I have to then forbid all the others and all the funding should only go by climate positive science. But anyway, why would you study a subject that you already know? Why would you study the climate change if you already know the climate change is true? But anyway, what the science indicates is serious trouble. And an informed public is never a bad thing. So actually you should spend your money on uh, indoctrinating the public at large. The idea behind these people is, and I put this also in uh, Stalinga.org, you cannot see this now anymore, Stalinga.org, about this, uh, why people believe in, in uh, things. And um, the let's say the Pascal's wager, why people believe in it, and it's basically like this. Climate change, if it is true, it is very, very important. And therefore, it is true, because we ha have to act as if it is true. It is so important uh, that we have to do as if it is true. Then, because it is true, we must hire scientists, scientists, pseudo-scientists, to prove it. And make propaganda and brainwash the people into believing it is true. And then you can see already the feedback that people are indoctrinated more and more and believing in it more and more and more and more demanding more indoctrinating and elimination of scientists that don't agree with this. This is all becoming a positive feedback religious cycle. This is Stanley Pascal's wager. See, please also exactly see Stalinger Kremlinsky uh, Psychology of Global Warming modeled with game theory decisions table in Euroscience Journal 13 of 2017. And see also the videos on the psychology of global warming, which I put there in Stalinger.org. It's all about politics. So imagine two groups of climatologists, the end of the world, the first group says, the end of the world is coming, the planet will heat up, you have to fund my research or we're all going to die, we're all doomed. And the other group says, there's nothing wrong with the climate. My work is therefore rather ir irrelevant, except to satisfy my personal curiosity. Can you please fund my research? So you can recognize here the words of uh, Ayn Rand, that we all, these have become moochers explaining why they need, the, why their needs, these needs of these are more important than the needs of these. Who will get uh, funding actually? Of course these ones. Uh, a little bit talk about global warming. So who started all this, uh, the initial um, idea of uh, global warming? Uh, that is, uh, for instance, uh, Mr. Uh, Roger Revel in 1982, he wrote in Scientific American, that the carbon dioxide would change the climate. Uh, and why did he do this? Simply because he needed the money. He was already one of the prototype moochers. Later, actually, he apologized for this, and he said that everything that he said was not true. And then Mr. Al Gore claimed that he was uh, now becoming a senile fool. Well, decide for yourself. Also note, in 1984, so two years after that, the alleged carbon dioxide problem was used to break the coal miners' uh, trade, trade unions in the United Kingdom by liberalist Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, which is here this funny thing. She was called the Iron Lady, as you may, uh, may know, and then she said, Iron Lady, rust in peace. So uh, she later inaugurated also the Hadley Science Center, and one of these people from the Hadley Science Center, they put actually when he uh, refereed one of my papers, uh, one of my manuscripts, this guy from the Hadley Science Center actually accused me of, uh, put his name there and accused me of having a, a political agenda. Well, he's working in the Hadley Science Center, that is a political institute to prove that uh, carbon dioxide is changing the climate uh, because they needed that to break the coal miners trade. So politics, politics, politics in Hadley Center, Science Center, Research Center, I should say. So what they want you to do, they want you to think outside the box, but within the walls that they have uh, made for you, they have confined you. It is general science. You are a great scientist. They tell you how great you are if you're doing some intelligent research, including technology, engineering, and tallying, if it's politically correct, and if it makes a profit. There's a good boy. 
including up to and including my own research, which was about uh, solar cells based on organic materials. Stalinga's research invent expensive new light sources, LEDs, to replace cheaper incandescent light bulbs and then let people, they will have LEDs at home, which don't produce heat, and then they have to heat their homes electrically when it is dark, which is normally then also colder while turning every city in some kind of Las Vegas. So all cities will become looking like this. Why? Because they can, because they have the energy for that. No technology ever reduced energy consumption. So my LEDs are not correct. Another thing is like these people that are studying the climate and they made, for instance, these drill holes in the planet, uh, all over the planet. Every drill hole costs uh, some $10 million dollars and has a huge carbon footprint. But they're telling you that you have to reduce your carbon footprint while they're proving the things that they already know. As you get it. Here another one. So we start doing then the brainwashing. There are scientists, researchers that are really dedicated on finding out how to brainwash you. Here are the people, I always use this one, Ero and Senyi, I guess. I have no idea how to pronounce their names. But they wrote a publication, Warm Words. And I say this once again. Let me cite it. The task of climate change agencies is not to persuade by rational argument. Instead, we need to work in a more shrewd and contemporary way using subtle techniques of engagement. The facts need to be treated as being so taken for granted that they not need to be spoken. Ultimately, positive climate behaviors need to be approached in the same way as marketeers approach acts of buying and consuming. It amounts to treating climate-friendly activity as a brand that can be sold. This is, we believe, the route to mass behavior change. Mass behavior change is uh, propaganda. This is uh, actually indoctrination. Brainwashing is actually uh, now called a persuasion strategy, which is a great euphemism uh, in political uh, jargon. Uh, for instance, this one, this is Mr. This is Rutman saying, our hope is that researchers will design persuasion strategies that effectively change people's implicit attitudes without them having to suffer through a disaster. So they're justifying indoctrination because of the importance of the agenda. This sounds exactly like the Soviet Union, where people had to be indoctrinated that the agenda of communism is great. Here another one. Um, it becomes so far that uh, dissidents have to put, be put in a gulag or in a prison, as they said here, for instance. I don't know who exactly said David Irving. Now, now David Irving is under arrest for. Uh, yeah, David Irving is the one who denies the Holocaust, or he actually asks for proof of it. But maybe this is the person says uh, Brendan O'Neill. Perhaps there is a case for making climate change denial an offense too. So go to prison if you deny climate change. You should go to prison. And one Australian columnist has proposed, so it's not Brandon, but somebody else. I don't know which name is written here. Never mind. It is the kind of voices are being heard now in society that people denying climate change has to be gone, sent to a gulag or prison. Definition of science. I go back to this once again. The complete definition is in two videos in Stalinga.org. But uh, the two books that I like very much where it is defined, uh, it's actually based on the ideas of Karl Popper, which is a science philosopher. And this is the book of Chalmers, where it is, um, what is this uh, th thing called science? And the other book, which is great, The Character of Physical Law of Richard Feynman. There it is explained what science actually uh, is. And it is more or less in these five points, you have to do research, to measure, to observe, then to reduce your data, to from there to induce and form a an hypothesis. And then you have to try to destroy your own hypothesis. You have to find proof against your hypothesis and not trying to find proof of your hypothesis, but against it. This is probably the most important uh, thing. And then you also have to show that's the only possible model that a hypothesis that works. So you have to falsify the other hypothesis. And it must come with a prediction. There must be something that it can be falsified. If you have a theory, an hypothesis that cannot be falsified, then your theory, your hypothesis is a religion. So for instance, if you any weather event is proof of climate change, then of course 
there is no prediction that could falsify your uh, hypothesis. Therefore, the hypothesis is religion. So therefore, the entire idea of climate change is, has become religion because it fails already directly here. And of course, you need replication. You have to tell your colleagues what you did, how you did it, and uh, on basis of what data, so that they can, in principle, replicate it and see and do uh, do the falsification. Let them do the falsification. And of course, first you have to have done your best, and you have told them. In it is you have should have told your peers that you have done your best to destroy your own model. There's no mention, not very well, there's no mention of political correctness, of any relevance to society, of a consensus, of benefits and outcomes, so that's again uh, the disprofits, about peer reviewing, that doesn't matter, and about the restriction of the subjects to study or what the, the outcomes is, should be politically correct. Funny thing is, in, um, in 2000, in the year 2000, this uh, Sven Ove Hansen, he um, did a test and uh, checked 70 papers in Nature, and he found that only one used the scientific method. So already in 2000, science was dead, we could say, but we found it already that in 1996 it died. Here, the global warming. Why it is not science? Because let's see these five points. Did they have an hypothesis? Yes. Did they have some data? Yes. Hmm. C uh, human carbon dioxide causes uh, climate change, causes the temperature to increase through the greenhouse effect. So they did a the hypothesis. That's very nice. Falsification? No. They only spent effort on proving it constantly, all the time finding uh, uh, evidence for their uh, theory. They, with the publications and research are filtered out in a Darwin, Darwinian feedback way, as I explained to you. The falsification is politically incorrect and equal to denying Holocaust. Not falsifi falsifiable with observations. The models are Bayesian uh, adjusted every year, so they can never be debunked. So therefore, it is not falsifiable. The contradicting data are actually seen as proof. For instance, that it's getting colder in Europe, it was seen as a... Uh, as a sign of global warming, which they then relabeled uh, climate change. So actually, this is called um, uh, backfire effect, from also ex in the explained in the videos on the psychology, that contradicting data is actually incorporated uh, to strengthen the belief in the theory. Did they show it was the only model? No, they didn't, because there was, there's also other models that can explain the warming. And there's also other models like um, like Henry's law that ex can explain the correlation between carbon dioxide and the temperature. And they never debunked them. So they didn't do the best to prove the other models wrong. Did they make a prediction? That is, no, they didn't. That is, predictions were made and they all failed. The hypothesis was not rejected, though. So uh, they had predictions that could falsify their theory, but they didn't then take the correct uh, decision and saying, well, at the end, our theories are nonsense. Did they do replication? No. Models and reasoning are never published. Like once I asked the um, uh, computer program that they used, and they didn't want to give it to me. They only showed the results of the simulations and that we have to believe that they did the correct work. See our videos on scientific method where I explain this even more. Uh, here's another one, for instance, how the IPCC is actually working. IPCC is the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's a political body, not a scientific body. And listen to this, how they go about. They basically start with approving the outline of their uh, new report that they're going to write. And then they hire the scientists to write it all up and then approve all this. And it says there directly, the outlines of the working group contributions already agreed by the panel. So we start with the conclusions and then do the science to prove it. Then accumulate all the data to prove it. And even to see how ridiculously these people are working, it is not about the truth, but about politically correct and about gender equality and all this uh, sustainability business and so on. For instance, it says here, um, Chairman Heusong Lee, I am gratified that we also have raised the proportion of women and scientists from developing countries involved in our work. So the things are true, not because they are true, but because they were set by, by women and developed countries. So to be politically correct. This is a, in a teletext from the Netherlands. It's in Dutch, but I will tell you what it says. 
the United Nations Working Group of the IPCC says that it is uh, that gov the feedback of governments or of politics is of utmost important importance to get scientific consensus on the report. So we need a polit political method, namely consensus, to approve what we call science. But it is no longer science than it is. It is politics. So when they tell you, follow the science, I'm sorry, the, f the science that I follow, the science in, in brackets, in quotation marks, it is actually, it, the science leads me to politics only. Or let me put it um, in this way, this funny way. Uh, the IPCC, it's telling itself, uh, hands up, those who thinks greenhouse gases have no effect, therefore we all need new jobs. Once again, they're all moochers according to Ayn Rand. Or, uh, as I also again say this one, the law of Angus, also called Angus's first law. Listen to this. All human organizations tend to be self-amplifying. There is an effect which hamstrings all corporations, even the most effective ones. It is the natural tendency of any organization to become ever more like what it already is. This is called the self-amplifying tendency. The longer an organization has spent becoming more as it is already, the stronger is the force of pushing it in the same direction, like matter being sucked into a black hole. Eventually, it will lose the ability to change at all without recognizing how it happened. And that is the IPCC. It is like a black hole that doesn't know how to change anymore. And they're all full of people that want to keep their job and uh, confiscate the money from uh, the people in a Randian way, uh, being moochers and explaining why they have so big needs. And they're all basically immoral. Uh, also here, the replication. Well, this is a typical example that we all know this hockey stick of uh, Michael Mann. And then um, uh, Steve McIntyre, a great hero in the climate science, he demanded from uh, Michael Mann to give him the data and the reasoning, so the replication part, and Ma Michael Mann refused. Uh, Steve McIntyre then um, put him in court and he had to hand it over because it was done by the uh, state U university, Penn State. <laughs> and as uh, McIntyre says, a man should go to the state pen in cherry. So not uh, Penn State, but state pen as a, as a joke. And then he had to release it. And then Michael Mann actually showed that whatever data um, was put in, the, in, his, um, in his method of Mr. Mann, it would create a hockey stick. It created hockey sticks, whatever numbers were fed in, and actually showed that Mann, uh, Michael Mann knew it. This is also called, uh, you can sometimes find the, uh, the climate scandal, climate gate, because they were also uh, demanding, scientists were demanding from, itself, from each other to get uh, more convincing data. So, the dark ages of science actually are back. Science and technology uh, engineering have been mixed. Science sounds more sexy. We calling engineering, we now call science, and we uh, make the uh, technical high schools, we call them universities, because it sounds more sexy than, uh, than a technical high school. School sounds inferior to a, a university. Uh, education has become dogmatic. Actually, in all our lectures, we tell our students that we know how the world works and there is no room for doubt. This is very similar to the end of the 19th century when people thought that Newton had had the last word. We are now saying that Einstein had had the last word and we are just actually explaining how the world works in our lectures and we're not creating any criticism uh, techniques from the, by the, in the students. We just tell them by authority that we know how the world works. This is also made worse by standardizing education. For instance, the Bologna uh, Treaty, that is uh, standardizing the uh, European uh, education system. People advocating biodiversity are normally against uh, intellectual diversity. They, don't, they want monolithic uh, intellectual uh, thinking in, in society. The idea is that science is settled. We just can now work out the details, so technology, and we can build uh, solutions to problems. Or for instance, we can build a large Hadron Collider to detect a Higgs boson instead of saying if the Higgs boson actually exists or not. The, simulation, the situation is similar to the beginning of the 20th century, as I told you, 19th century. 
the beginning of sorry the beginning the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century research by now is only technology projects include milestones and deliverables and is aimed to proving what we already know how would einstein do in 2013 what is missing also is uh, serendipity that you discover things by just by by luck and that is uh, maybe uh, based on this what bernard heisch uh, is saying advances are made by answering questions Discoveries are made by questioning answers, and this uh, questioning answers, that is actually science, to find out where the theory can be debunked, where they can be falsified. A scientist should be multi-area and not have a limited vision. But we're trying to give somebody a PhD, for instance, on, uh, on chemistry, and then he can no longer make a statement about the climate because he, is not, he doesn't have a PhD in climate. But a PhD is a PhD. People should not be limited in their vision to, as a chemist, to limit their ideas only to chemistry. It's very difficult to do in a culture publish or perish, because if you don't publish, you have, you will be out of the pool and you need to publish. You can only do, you can do it fastest in your area where you have most experience. So therefore you people will become more and more limited in their vision. We should actually, what I should say, we should stop the publication spam and people let, uh, don't do peer reviewing at all anymore. All the rest is technology. But long live science. Even if you destroyed science, people will do science. And I see here a very nice uh, book, uh, The Black Swan, by uh, Nassim Taleb. Uh, he was a successful stockbroker, uh, but not a professional scientist, but he wrote a very nice, what I would call scientific book, uh, paraphrased by, deluded by the simplicity of the bell curve. I like this uh, very much. So you can also see this video explained in the video of empirical forecasting, which is there in Stalinga.org or in Euroscience Journal 13 of 2017. To get the idea, the, um, uh, the what is called the ludic fallacy by um, Nassim Taleb is that uh, doing as if nature is constantly flipping coins, as if nature is probabilistic. But as Aristotle said, only that what will happen can happen. So we apply this to the weather and the climate. Nature is not flipping coins and the entire bell curve here, this is nonsense. So if you get an outlier, then they say it's climate change. This, uh, uh, this logic is not making sense. Once again, please go to Stalinga.org where this is explained about empirical forecasting, why this is all uh, nonsense. And I'm nearly already at the end. Uh, what I would like to say here, two phrases of uh, important of some uh, interesting people. For instance, here Max Born, he said, the belief that there is only one truth and that oneself is in possession of it seems to me the deepest root of all evil that is in the world. So never listen to people that, that say that we know the truth and that we have to follow their science. You always have to go against their science. And Stephen Hawkins also said it like this, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but is the illusion of knowledge. Don't think that the world has all the knowledge. If they tell you that we already know all the answers, that is complete nonsense. In other words, people that say they know the truth are complete idiots. So here are the conclusions. I explained to you that science is dead, not performed by uh, professionals anymore at least. Science is not a strategy, technology is. Horizons 2020 is a technology strategy to improve the world. It's a political program to replace human labor with technology and push humans into poverty. And now we have a new version, which is called Agenda 2030, which is more of the same, but in an even stronger way. It becomes more and more like a communist way, also explained by uh, Ayn Rand. Science is alive. You cannot stop people, people will still keep on thinking and behind the professional academic people's back there are a lot of people on the internet on all the social media and I have already met so many people that uh, some of them they do not even have a, uh, an education academic education but they're doing very nice intellectual uh, ideas they come up with some very good ideas so the future of science is actually probably on the social media and uh, media and even if 90 percent or 99 percent is nonsense in the academic world it's nearly 100 percent nonsense there's still a lot of work to be done also in technology and, and engineering note science is not better than technology this is not about what is better it is just different and don't be ashamed of your own ideas really think out of their box don't care, you can come up with uh, conspiracy uh, theories. That, that's, if, you can be, if you are able to uh, 
thinking conspiracies, then you're already starting becoming uh, a good scientist. Don't be intimidated into uh, not thinking. Don't be afraid being politically incorrect or to go against dogmas. Be a skeptic. Be agnostic. Don't be a sucker, as Mr. Taleb actually says. Uh, this ends my presentation. I hope you liked it. I would also like to thank here Prof uh, Professor Igor Chmielinski, who actually uh, is, is uh, also part of his uh, the ideas presented here also are coming from him. And at the end, I, uh, that time, I ended with this funny phrase. I will read it for you and then you will understand it. It is 10Q for your attention. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>